All right. Um, so Heidi Helfeld uh, will uh, talk about reteaming in a lot of organizations and in Scrum we talk about how keeping teams together is extremely important, but in reality, a lot of times our teams change and it's more dynamic than what we consider an agile or stable team. So without further ado, please help me welcome Heidi to speak. go. Thanks so much, Milan. It's so nice to be here. It's great to be in Maine. It's my first time here, and I've been just really enjoying the local environment. I got to, got to walk around the city yesterday and even go see, go visit Cape Elizabeth, and wow, just beautiful. Got to go down by the water on the rocks. Just a wonderful, wonderful place. I'm really happy to be here. I really appreciate it. And uh, thanks to the University of Southern Maine as well for the space and to the sponsors. So I'm Heidi Helfand, and uh, we'll get started. So like many of you, I read a lot of books. And as Milan alluded to uh, when he introduced me, a lot of the things that, that I've learned is that wisdom like this, traditional wisdom, keep, you know, teams with stable membership perform better. And I, I've read a lot about this, and I'm wondering what you think about it. So just take a minute, think about this, and talk to the person next to you. Is this something that you believe in? Is this something that you've experienced? Is this something that's attainable? Take a minute and talk with the person next to you. Okay, that's what it sounds like when 300 people talk at one time. So, yeah, I read wisdom like this and I thought to myself, I've been in environments that change a lot. And, you know, here, the company that I'm at right now is called Procore, and we're growing and growing and growing. And so I kind of, you know, wondered to me, I wondered myself, and I ask this question all over the world, um, what about your situation? So raise your hand if you've had a new person join your company in the past month. Okay, and take a look around. Okay. Now, raise your hand if someone has left your company or maybe has left your team. Maybe they have gone to another team within your company. And take a look around. You know, I really believe that team change is inevitable, so we can focus there. Let's get better at that as opposed to going for the quest of having teams that are unchanging. And I became curious about this because my experience, again, had been different. And I really feel like teams are systems, and it only takes the addition or the uh, loss of one person to change your team system. So new people are going to join, and they bring different things such as new ideas, differences of opinion, differences of background, even personality changes. I remember uh, here when uh, my colleague Paul Tevis, we worked together at a company called Apolio, when he came, I mean, this guy stood on tables. No one had quite done that before. <laughs> so it could be something that's a personality trait, could be a bold move like this, and I was like, wow, you know, I'm really glad he's here. Like, maybe I can stand on a table. It's very inspiring to me. <laughs> You know, conversely, when people leave, the system is different. And when more and more people leave, it can be even more dramatic. You know, maybe the, the, team, the team compositions changes so dramatically that they change their name. The identity feels different. It doesn't feel like we're the same as before. You know, but then I'm wondering, like, what else leaves? This is a photo of, uh, from years ago when I was on a team. And uh, Tim in the back there had taught us all how to juggle. So we would do pair programming. We were, we were building software for property management companies. We'd take breaks and we'd have juggling competitions. But then when Tim left, sadly, the juggling kind of faded out. 
So we bring these things, you know, we bring our whole person to work, we bring ourselves to work. So it's not, we are more than our roles. So Tim brought his unique personality and characteristics. You know, sometimes it really hurts when people leave. This is a photo of a startup that I was a part of. And when our founder left, I think we, we did gymnastics to try to understand, like, what did he do? How can we carry it on? You know, I don't even know if there was, like, founder job description. He was our CTO. But when he left, it really, really hurt. Really, really hurt. So it feels different when people leave. Other times, we're kind of glad they're gone. <laughs> but yet, maybe they linger on. The thought of the person kind of lingers on like a ghost. You're trying to kick them off, and it's really difficult. So sometimes we have this, like, this... You know, people leave, but they still kind of feel like they're there. It can, there can be a lot of sadness with this as well, because we don't want them to go, but then they do, or they leave our team and go over there. They're, if they stay in the company, maybe we can still kind of hang out, have lunch. But sometimes, you know, these are very human things. And uh, yeah, so I, I looked back at my own experience, 20-ish 20, 20 years in the software industry, and I thought, when I looked at that conventional wisdom that we talked about at the beginning, were we doing it wrong? Was, was it, you know, we have more of a moving target. It was more about like managing that and trying to get better at that as opposed to this sort of ideal. And so, you know, I felt like we weren't doing it wrong. You know, there's research that talks about fluid teams or teams being more dynamic is more and more the norm. And this is in 2012. You know, a wonderful book here by Amy Edmondson, acknowledging that teams have more of a constantly shifting membership. You know, these are the things that we're dealing with. So it's kind of like, where do you want to put your focus? I was part of just a little bit of background about me. The first startup that I was at, I was the, what was I, the 15th employee. I stayed until 800 people. We weren't this one team that was unchanged. Now, sure, there's a concentric notion of teams that at different levels, but our, we had to morph and adjust the structure as we grew. And we were a very successful company despite having this changeable team membership. So I was on the founding teams, the original teams we invented, go to meeting and go to webinar. So was it, you know, the company was successful. It wasn't like we were doing it wrong. I joined the second startup, I guess, eight years later, and I was the 10th employee, and I stayed till there were about 600. I was there for a number of years. We had more kind of dramatic uh, reteaming at this company, you know, again, we, this company was also very successful despite the fact that, again, the membership of the teams changed a lot. This company went public in June 2015. Very proud of this company. It's called Appfolio in Santa Barbara, California. So now I work, I'm a practitioner. I work inside a company and I love it. I work as a director of engineering excellence at Procore Technologies, we're in Carpinteria, California, that's our headquarters. And I joined later on, so now I'm coaching a lot of people that were part of the first team at this company. And I, I support an organization about, uh, in R&D about 350 people, and our mission is to make the lives of people better in construction. Okay? So we create all sorts of tools for the job site, so you can, you can look at the plans on your phone, you can attach photos and everything about the ecosystem of construction. So I'm really, really happy to be a part of Procore. I've worked there about two years. And again, it's kind of later in the experience of company building than I had had before. So two-time startup person. And the company is growing and changing very fast. So I work internally and help with continuous improvement and other projects. So let's dig in a bit. So dynamic reteaming, it's the name of the book, it's the name of the concept, but it's essentially about team change, okay? And I think that teams age and change. And there's a metaphor here, which is an eco-cycle. There's a book called Panar Panarchy by Gunderson and Holling, another book called Liberating Structures, which uses this sort of metaphor. But it's basically a, kind of a, a metaphor or a window that I've applied to teams. So if we take a look, first of all, at this, so we have birth, adolescence, maturity, and disruption. We have some growth and renewal. So it's this eco-cycle. If we take a look, just an example from nature, something, you know, they plant the seeds, maybe they grow, they, they reach kind of maturity, and then maybe at some point there's some sort of destruction, like a wildfire, something that emits seeds, and then the cycle continues. I think there's an aging related to teams. 
And so I've applied that, and I'll use that in the rest, that metaphor in the rest of this talk. When I was digging into the research about this book, again, I reflected back and I was like, gosh, this traditional wisdom says, keep all this stuff the same, but my experience was different. I became curious. When you become really, really curious, you can start to write a book. And then you do research and you learn more. So I interviewed people from all over the world, and I gathered stories about why teams changed. And they seem to fall into, into these general categories. Okay? Teams changing because of growth or shrinking of the company. There's a lot of stories about that, and a lot of stories I'll tell you in this talk as well today. Other reasons team change is because new work, a new project, a new area of focus comes up, so people want to shift it and create a new team. Knowledge sharing is another reason why teams change. We'll see that with a switching pattern. Maybe sometimes you feel like you're stagnating and you need to work on something new. Maybe it's new material you want to work over here. Maybe you want to work with someone else in your company. Okay. And the other thing, you know, again, stagnation. Nothing lasts forever. Our interests grow and change. So it's another reason why teams change. And I think it also happens at different levels. Again, here's that ego cycle, but it's at different levels. I could have changes at the company level. Maybe my company gets acquired. When I was on the startup that was that where we created go to meeting, suddenly, you know, out of the blue, at least from my vantage point, I was on the web development team. Suddenly we got acquired by Citrix. That was a big global change that had an effect and it had a feel. It's different than when maybe somebody comes in, in, into your company or leaves at like the person level or at the group of teams level. Maybe you have shifts and suddenly things are reorged over here or there. Tribe I'm referring to as like groups of teams. So this happens at different levels and sometimes it gets quite dynamic because you have changes at all these different levels at once. And the bigger you get, the less you can even see it, uh, it you know, what's in your, in your purview. So it happens at different levels. And I think it also happens in different ways. And this is an image from Sam Kainer. He wrote the book, A Facilitator's Guide to Participatory Decision Making. And whether we like it or not, regardless of what our politics are, we're going to have some changes that happen to us. We're going to have some changes that we might catalyze. And we're going to have some changes where we are able to give input into how it goes. And so these are the, some of the graphics here, more of a top-down change, some kind of change where a decision maker at the top is making the decision but gathering input. And here, on the, on your, the far right here, to you, it's a, a decision that's made by, let's say, a team or a group of people. So this stuff tends to go down in different ways, regardless of what we think about. So how can we cope and get better at these types of situations? And also, you know, the context. So the patterns. So besides like the reasons why teams change kind of were derived from the research. Again, I did these interviews. I transcribed the interviews and I coded them for themes. And the themes are what I wrote about in the book. And there are five base patterns to re-teaming at the most basic level, kind of structural patterns. One by one is one of the patterns. <laughs> Grow and split. So one by one, addition of one person, another person leaves. Again, whether it's within the company or out. Grow and split. Teams grow big and they split. Raise your hand if you've noticed that happening in your environment. Teams grow kind of big and then they split. People are added. I see some hands. Switching. People switching from one team to the next for a variety of reasons. There's also isolation. Create a new team, put the team off to the side, give them process freedom, and deliberate keeping them away from others. When I was at the first startup, Expert City, we were before we created GoToMeeting, we were created, we were gonna change the world with tech support, and we had a live marketplace where you could come to our website, ask a tech support question, and get the help of a real live expert through screen sharing to solve your problem. Well, the problem with that was nobody wanted it. Nobody would buy it. We spent $10 million on this, and I was part of the isolated team off to the side where we created a product called GoToMeeting, and it saved the company. So isolation is another pattern. Maybe you have a, some kind of crisis at work. Maybe you have some performance, performance issues or some kind of production errors. Teams off to the side are usually helpful with those types of situations as well. Then we have situations where teams come together, or at the higher level, remember we were talking about those different levels, companies come together. We were acquired by, by Citrix. Uh, Expert City was acquired by Citrix. Later on, the legacy of that company acquired again 
just in the last year or two by Log Me In. So, so there's a coming together pattern as well, which is merging. So I'm going to focus on the top three for the remainder of this talk. Here's a little bit of visual of the one by one pattern. So let's dig into that first. So again, one by one pattern, let's say you're like using the eco cycle as a metaphor. Again, it's just a lens to view this content for meaning making. You know, you one by one, you kind of add people into your, into your company. Those are two founders up there in blue. Um, but I'm wondering here, I think you can also think about this as like the path of a new hire. Somebody comes in, you know, first they kind of join the company. Maybe they, they start to have success and they're getting the hang of it. Or maybe even dominating the role, doing really, really well, kind of, you know, kind of really mastering it. If they don't, maybe they kind of struggle. In some of the literature about these eco-cycles, they call that a poverty trap. But maybe they're kind of struggling over here. Maybe or maybe not. It's a trap. So maybe they're doing really, really well. Or maybe, I don't know about you, and I'm kind of curious as well, so I'll ask you in a moment, but sometimes we feel like we need a change. And even if we're, we've mastered a role, we feel like we're kind of on autopilot, we need a change, some kind of disruption to happen. We either catalyze it ourselves or maybe an opportunity comes our way so we get this kind of renewal and the cycle continues. So take a minute and talk to the person next to you. Where do you think you are in a cycle like this? Have you been in your role for just a short period of time? Do you feel like you need a change? Do you feel like you're stagnating? Are you in a period of disruption where something just happened and you're starting over, you're starting again? Talk with the person next to you for a minute. Where are you? <laughs> Who's just started a new role or a new job? Who's in kind of like the newish phase? Raise your hand. You can kind of look around. You can support each other. Okay. Who's been in their role like a really long time? You feel like maybe it's time for something a little bit different. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay. You can look around. You can support each other. Okay. I think I'm kind of in the growth phase of my current role. And maybe it's different for everybody, like especially time-wise. I've been at my job for two years, but I still feel like it's fresh and things are changing. Um, yeah, so organizational vision. So when people get added, I guess, one by one to your company, uh, sharing the vision or plan is kind of helpful. So what, and what are you going to do as you hire and as people come in? Are you going to add people into existing teams or are you going to start new teams? Like what's the vision there? It's kind of a question. I've been at places where um, people are hired in a batch and we spread them across multiple teams. It's almost like a wave in the system, but with things like mentoring and peer programming, it helps to kind of keep the practices that we want to have live on by kind of spreading people out. I think also, if you're in an environment where you want to start some new practices, maybe some new ways of working, that are different from what's current. You can start a team off to the side and start with new practices and kind of grow from there. These are deliberate decisions. I have a photo of a, of a room where there was an isolated team doing something completely different. It's, 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 a, it's a little bit of the isolation pattern. So start a team off to the side and grow from there. Later kind of deprecate that other structure. 
So having a team off to the side is a good way for that kind of process renewal if you want to grow from there. And I think it feels different depending on who the person is coming aboard. When you have a new executive that joins, suddenly things might feel quite different than when a new peer joins. So, so there's something about that as well. When I, and, and it could be kind of triggering depending on who the person is. These are two, uh, you know they're founders because they're hanging a whiteboard. <laughs> These are two founders of, uh, the, the gentleman on the right is Klaus, he's one of the co-founders of the company that where we built GoToMeeting, and John is his co-founder at the second startup, Appfolio, uh, where, where they're building software for property management and other workflows. But I would, they were both my managers for many years, and I always looked to them for advice. I learned a lot from them, and we created some amazing things together. But I would get triggered sometimes when new people joined. I'd feel like, I don't know, you know, I get you know, problems, right? So I'd be like, help me, what am I gonna do? And you know, this new person has joined, maybe I was involved in the hiring, maybe I wasn't, and Klaus would always say, well, you really gotta build the relationship. You know, why don't you go have lunch with them? John would always have sort of a founder's mindset, and he'd be like, how can you help this other person be successful? Other wisdom that I've heard throughout the years is, well, what can you learn from this new person? So sometimes it's not as easy as just we're hiring the people and we're bringing them aboard. We're all these people together, and because of our brains, sometimes we can get triggered. And I find myself repeating these things to the people that I coach, because I think it is timeless wisdom, and again, I don't know about you, but I tend to get very triggered. And, and the more I go through time, the more I notice when it's happening so I can try to you know, maybe manage it a bit. Years ago, I remember I was early in my career and I was on this web development team and I was working as an editor. Suddenly, I, I, I'm home for the weekend, I look in the newspaper and there's a job for a web editor in the newspaper. And I was like, what, what is going on here? Are they, like, am I getting fired? Are they replacing me? And I had no idea, and I remember stewing over this for a time wondering, well, what's gonna happen to me? And the, and the fact was that they, there was a vision of having multiple people in a role like mine, but nobody talked about it. And I think, you know, reflecting back, I think it's important to share the vision of where your structure is going, at least in the near future, right? So I think that's something that you can do to get better at it. Other things to get better at, this one-on-one -on -one pattern, having a buddy system, Pair programming is wonderful to help bring new people aboard for your uh, understanding your code base and building relationships and then switching pairs. There's some research that's uh, cited by Daniel Coyle in his book, uh, The Culture Code, and he talks about a company, a call center, that when they had new hires come on, they did, a t they did a, an experiment where they had half of the new hires talk about their interests, like if you were stranded on an island, what about you would help your survival? They also did things where they gave the jackets for the company, but they put the person's name. Like they deliberately focused on personalizing experience and having the new hire not just get acclimated to the company that they were joining, but to also deliberately share about themselves, and they found that they had higher retention. I thought that was interesting. Now when people leave, Remember that photo with the ghost? Sometimes we're glad they're gone, but sometimes it can be really, really a, feel like a loss. And so there's this idea from organizational relationship systems coaching, it's some training that I've had, we refer to it as ORSC, called inner roles and outer roles. I was working with a team, and their product manager wound, wound up taking a job at another company. And it was a big loss for this team. And so he did the traditional things like you might read about in product management. So he had those outer roles, those public roles, like out of all the 50 product managers, they all do this similar stuff. But since they're different people, they bring different personalities. This guy would get the team to go to the bluffs. This is a photo outside my workplace, believe it or not, in Carpinteria, California. He'd, the team would accomplish something, he'd take them to the edge, and they'd scream off the, the edge of the cliff. Like, it was something that he would just do and encourage them to do when they'd accomplished something really, really big. So when I was working with this team, one of the things that we talked about was, well, we gotta talk about the fact that this person left, but what do we wanna carry on that he did? And so that's one of the things that someone took on. Okay, we're gonna go shout at the top of the cliffs 
when we have a big accomplishment. So those are like inner roles. Somebody brings the donuts on Thursdays. That's not part of the job description, but it's the things that they do. So when people leave, you can get better at, at dealing with the situation by talking about what did they do beyond their role that we want to carry on. Also putting the systems into continuous improvement. How many of you do, do retrospectives? in your work, most of us do. We're used to doing them maybe at the team level, but we have to put these other systems into reflection as well, such as maybe an onboarding program or a training program. So we reflect on the experience. At one company I was at, six months after people started, we'd have a retrospective to improve the experience. And it would really, really kind of generate the, the, the learning and the, and the continuous improvement in this organization. Okay, so moving on to the next pattern, the grow and split pattern. One of the most common reteaming patterns I've found. So team grows big and it splits. Could split in more than two pieces, more than this picture. But it's kind of like this. I feel like sometimes you're, we're looking back at the eco cycle again, and here I have poverty trap and rigidity trap. Poverty trap being that like failure to thrive. Rigidity traps kind of like the stagnation. So let's say a team grows big and it might feel something like this. When your team grows, I see some head nod, head, heads nodding from some of these words probably. It's, it's harder to make decisions when you have a larger group of people. You need facilitation, you can do it, but decisions take longer. Maybe the work becomes unrelated. So if you're having a stand up, people aren't necessarily listening to each other or the meetings take a lot longer. Has this happened in your experience? So there's different solutions that you could do. Maybe bring in different facilitation, different techniques, get more rigid with your meeting times and, and, and that structure, or sometimes teams just split in half. And so essentially then, you're dealing with a couple of new teams. And I have this deliberately over here because there are things that you can do to reset these teams after they change. You essentially have new teams. They, they might feel like more of a new team, if um, the majority goes to one side, you have less remaining on the other team, and then you add new people in, it might feel a lot, lot different. And identities might change. This is a big team that split in half. Maybe this side, Diff Leopard, is gonna split again. It's getting kind of big. But they gave themselves unique names when they split. They kind of owned it. Rachel Davies, a coach that I know from, from London, when, when her first team split at a company called Unruly, they celebrated the split with a Lord of the Rings inspired cake. It was like the splitting of the fellowship. So you can have fun with this stuff. Yeah, and so, you know, role clarity is something that helps. If you have a lot of switching and changing, and you have a lot of this happening, getting really solid on kind of these outer roles, like what does someone in a UX role typically do on a team? What does someone in a quality role typically do? Someone in a product role? If you really align on that with all of the teams, it makes it easier when you switch later. And so also sharing preferences is helpful too. Nolan here doesn't mind if you come tap him on the shoulder and ask him a question when he's deep into work. But other people have really strong preferences, like no, please send me a, a message or like, let's meet later when I don't have code on my screen. We get team agreements down, we share these sorts of preferences when the teams change, and it's a, something that you can do during a team reset. So then I wonder to myself, okay, well, why does all this happen? I mean, we talked about some of the difficulties of working with bigger teams, and sometimes we read, you know, we read, we're here at a conference, we wanna get better, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I'm, I can't wait to learn from the other speakers today, because I wanna bring stuff back to Procore when I get back. Uh, back to work, but you know, maybe we read about team size in things like the Scrum Guide. You know, three or more people, seven plus or minus two is the ideal team size. We want the wisdom, we want to do better. So maybe we split teams and make them smaller because of this kind of wisdom. You know, maybe again, we don't know how to facilitate when the group gets really big. There are techniques we can use to facilitate 300 people that are very similar to facilitating 13 people. But then when you have like six people together, suddenly you don't need to worry about that stuff. You can go you know, in a round table and get stuff, get stuff done. But then I, I wonder to myself, okay, wait, large teams work too. There's a story in the book from William Them. He's an engineering manager at Trade Me in New Zealand. 
like for deliberate reasons, he would bring teams together. You know, it's like the, it's the merging pattern. When they were porting a system from one language to another, they repair programming. And they found that having a larger team helped them have better variety when pair programming. So sometimes large teams work too. And then I wonder to myself, okay, who gets to decide? And what if it's the team? What if the people decide? It's left out of all the scrum training, the agile training, and other things that team composition is a lever to pull for going for team excellence or going for effectiveness. But what if the people decide? I was with a team, and they split in half, and they did multi-platform development, and they had a couple of uh, iOS developers coding in Swift, and they decided to do something like this. The team split, and then the iOS developers would go from team to team and follow the priority. Now, did that work? Did it not work? Well, the point is they got to decide, and they did it through reflecting on their structure. So I thought, God, that is so cool. Like, why was, you know, we hear about self-organizing teams in Agile, but why would, you know, let's put team composition on the table as a lever for teams to pull or to experiment with to try to get better at what they do. It was, it's the quest for excellence. It's like, that's, that's why I have the Director of Engineering Excellence title. It's kind of like the quest for excellence. We can try different experiments. But sometimes we have tectonic shifts. Sometimes we have bigger shifts in the company. I've been talking about the team level with the grow and split, and I've been talking about the one by one where, you know, kind of more re-teaming at the edges. But sometimes we have bigger changes, right? Maybe at these levels, at the company, department, tribe. And sometimes I think it's kind of like more on this side of the spectrum where, <laughs> You know, I didn't go to the meeting when Citrix acquired Expert City. I wasn't privy to that discussion, but it's something that I had to kind of, you know, accept as an employee. And it was fine, you know, but some of these decisions are made in different ways. So sometimes we're coping with the team changes that happen around us, and other times we're catalyzing them. And there's recommendations and advice how do we get better when we're planning these larger changes? Like this is, these are some suggestions from the wonderful book, Creating Intelligent Teams, which talks about coaching teams as systems. Highly recommend that book. But careful planning of this stuff is not easy. These are some suggestions that they have. You know, but how can we involve the people? And so that's what I would encourage you to think about. If you're in the position where you're involved in large, and you're, you're you're in the group that's deciding large structural changes, I'd, in, in, I'd encourage you to think of things that bring the people into the conversation. Here's a photo of a very large change that impacted 80 people. And the leaders of this group decided to visualize the changes on whiteboards. So they have lines with hiring, and then they have, it's a tribe and squad structure. Essentially, you had a big tribe that split into two or three different pieces, so it's grow and split at a larger level. But they decided to take this to the people. And so here's the existing teams, here's the existing people on the teams, here's the hiring plan, and what, one of the, the things about making this more of an open situation, one of the results here was some of the engineers were like, well, you have this squad over here, wouldn't it make more sense over here, and here's why, and then they made the change. So like the earlier, the better with this kind of stuff. So this is one way of kind of being more inclusive in the, in the reteaming. There's a story in the book from Christian Linwall of Spotify, which inspired learning this structure and kind of doing this like reteaming using whiteboards as a tool to visualize it. You can get even more open by taking all the names off and encouraging switching. It depends on, on, on what you want to do. So it's kind of going from, from the photo on the left, again, adopting it from Sam Kainer, Sam Kainer's tool about decision making, but more to more of the right side where you get this input from the people and it's not just these are the changes, go accept them, cascade the message, it's a little bit different. This is a photo of a self-selection team event where the people chose the teams that they were going to be on and so it's a lot more open. The people choose the topics and the people form the teams. Sandy Mamoli and David Mole wrote a book, great book, called Creating Great Teams, and they talk logistically about having open marketplace uh, events where people select teams, self-selection they call it, and you can try it out with hack days. This is a hack day where the people served up the topics, the people formed the teams, and then they went and they built the stuff. 
but it gets people understanding what it could be like. Like, what if it was the teams? No matter what you're doing, this stuff, there's a lot of fear related to team change. It's just a fact. Even if people are going to get a choice in the matter or not, over-communicating what you're doing cannot be underemphasized. Patrick Lencioni is talking about the magic number seven, saying it at least seven times. People just don't, with, even with positive intent, I believe that we have positive intent when we're doing these changes. I wholeheartedly do, but it's hard to convey the messages sometimes. People just, people miss it, it's complicated. Other times you have really, really fast growth. It's kind of something like this. And then you might have concerns of the first team. You know, I was on that first team twice. Now I coach people that were part of that first team. The people, sometimes they refer to it as the old guard, right? The people that have been at that company forever and they have, there's something special about them and they know everybody and they know how to get work through the system. I see some smiles, right? So, but it can be very, very difficult when your company grows, like, because it can feel totally different. Our company is changing. We're not like we were before, right? So what do you do? It's, there can be periods, it can be very confusing. You know, and then you have stuff like this, so it's kind of like the new people join, and it's like kind of, what am I allowed to do? Like, who owns that? I want to make a contribution. I've heard that if I stay quiet for a while, then later I can speak up. You know, we, we tell ourselves these things, like I want to feel comfortable. You know, but that is like, is, am I going to step on her toes if I do that thing? I really, really want to. You know, but is it okay if I, we, we have this hesitation. But then on the other side, we have the people that, you know, the pe that have been there for a while, like, why aren't they stepping up? Like, don't they care? Like, can't, where's the initiative? You know, but it's like a delicate balance of all of this stuff, you know? And then this question inevitably comes up, how do we maintain our culture? So talk to the person next to you. If somebody said that to you, how would you respond when this question comes up? And people use this word, maintain. So what does that mean to you? Talk to the person next to you for a minute. Maintain our culture. <laughs> clap once, you can hear my hands clap twice, you can hear my voice clap three times. Okay. How do we maintain our culture? This is what people ask. So what does that actually mean? It's, it's concerns of the first team. We feel this change. It feels different than before. We are changing. We're adding. We're morphing. It's not going to be like it was before. Some stuff might carry through, maybe stuff related to values or principles. Maybe we anchor to things like that. Things might be different. We focus a lot on bringing the new person on, but what about the people that are already there? These guys are having a conversation. It's different if they're actually looking at each other, right? It's, there's a, a tension that we need to have to each other, and especially about we have to focus as well on the people that are already there. So I think there's a lot of kind of re-belonging. If we have a new person that joins, maybe they go through a dip, it's a satire change curve, and you know, it's hard to get acclimated to a new company, but we also have to understand that the people that are already there might also be kind of going through a dip. And so I think, you know, great quote here from this book, Leadership on the Line, which is a highly interesting book, you know, people, don't fear change, they feel loss. With the addition of this new person or this group of people, what's gonna change for me? What about my job? What about my role? What about my identity as the person that does this thing? That's why I think, again, back to the story of seeing my job in the newspaper, <laughs> you know, we gotta talk about the plans, we gotta talk about this stuff. And, you know, again, like, it's like a skipping record. 
like helping the new people belong, but then helping the people that are already there belong. Like you belong here, you belong here, you belong here. Like how do we send these belonging cues that we're all this one new place? It's not gonna be like it was before. In ORSC we talk about this edge behavior. So there's the current state over here on the left and we've got this future state. I roll with the changes. It's easy for me to get across the edge. Maybe somebody says that, but for others it's harder. We're all different, we're you know, different people. So if the people are represented by these X's, like you know, some of us get caught at the top and like, ugh, gotta get over you know, to this future state. It's always gonna be renewing, it's always gonna be different, like that eco cycle. And so message, messaging, I love that word messaging. Let's send the messaging. No, but this is our company, right? So it's not like this is your company. I feel ownership of this company if I've been there for a long time. But new people, when they join, it's their company too. This is our company. So we, how do we foster that? We're growing this thing together, right? How do we acknowledge this reality? Well, open space helps a lot, right? Here's a picture from an open space about improving collaboration amongst an organization, about 350 people in this organization. Like, the people that have been there for a long time and all the new people, how do we help them find shared causes? How do we help them know each other's names is one challenge. How do we help them find each other, especially if they're in different buildings? You can foster events where in open spaces, let's say, some, where the people make the, the schedule of the conference all day. We, we are at this conference and we have predetermined speakers. But with this, internal to a company, you can pose a challenge, like how can we improve our collaboration, and the people serve up answers and have discussions. So then the people can find each other. Another activity that I do to bridge this challenge is called the story of our team. I do this one a lot. I have plans to do it next month. I did it a couple of weeks ago. You have the people line up in terms of when they join the team or the company. And then they make a shared timeline, when each person joined, when they left, significant milestones. They talk about why they joined. And then we make like a lo-fi video telling the story of the team. And then the people that just started get to hear the stories from the people that have been there for a few years. And then the people that have been there for a few years get to hear the stories of the excitement and why these people just joined three months ago. So it's the story of our team. So we have a shared context. We archive it in a video. We did it with a... I was visiting Procore's office in London recently, so there were a number of people there at ver for, that joined from various times, so we did that with the, with the office. And I tell people a lot, it's like, appreciate who we are becoming, but because we are, are becoming, we're in this constant state of becoming <coughs> something else, this period of renewal in our company, and it feels different every day. Traditions can help. At this company, this is the second startup that I was at. Early on, we did a whitewater rafting retreat. See how we have this rafting oar? Every year, we'd take our development team on vacations together for two days. We called it a tech retreat, and it was just to build relationships. So we'd go whitewater rafting. We'd do active things. We all went to Disneyland one day. Team building by screaming cannot be underestimated. I was on the Tower of Terror with some people I didn't know very well, and believe me, you get back to the office on Monday, and you have that shared experience of screaming at the top of your lungs, you're brought together <laughs> in a way that you couldn't imagine. So creating traditions helps. So again, this company did every year at a cadence, they did a retreat. They still do it. Symbols help to glue the company together as, <clears throat> as it changes through time. That rafting oar became a symbol. We'd celebrate, we'd sign our names at key moments. When, the, when I was there, when the company went public, we all signed an oar. So it was this kind of persistent symbol. So what are those persistent things, kind of like the connective tissue of the company, right? There's a gong behind uh, the guy with the avocado shirt. We bang a gong with significant events at this company, celebrate milestones. It's something that, we constantly did, it was a tradition. <clears throat> That's like glue. Values, another sense of company glue. Ownership, openness, and optimism, it almost felt like principles at the company that I'm at now. The engineers use these. They come from a place of openness. You saw that reteaming on a whiteboard? That brought more openness to our reteaming. It's one of the company values. Again, those are things that help 
when, when your company is growing really fast, you can add things on later. <clears throat> but the thing is, not everything lasts. It doesn't always stay the same. You know, hence the point of this talk with the reteaming. You know, but we'll, we'll shift gears into the third pattern I'm going to talk about, which is switching. When people switch from one team to the next, your interest level is not going to stay the same. You get to go to different sessions today, and you're not stuck with me all day in here. You get to switch. We learn from new people. It's a human thing. Sometimes we might be bored for whatever reason and need a change. It's very switching pattern is, deals with a lot of like human factors. It could be that you know we just don't want to work with them anymore. This, you know, the dog's not happy. You can see the dog back there. He's super bored. These guys have been working together so long. They, they wear the same hat, and you know, it's 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 it, we don't talk about this that much, but maybe, you know, the chemis chemistry matters. I mean, if we let people choose their teams, maybe we have a better chance at chemistry. I don't know. Maybe the teams are too much this the same if we work with all of our friends, or maybe that's better. We have to experiment and try different things. But then there's this other thing of stagnation, of feeling like you need to learn, you need a change so you can continue learning. We learn from people and we learn from a change of topics. So it's almost like this rigidity trap in, in eco-cycle terms here. Sometimes we just need a shift. And if, you, if it happens with a lot of people, it can get the sense of, God, this place is just, the tone is, feels so low. It could be confusing because you could be wrong. You could look at a team and make a judgment and say, they're not doing too well just because they're not lively. But you might be wrong. Um, or you, know, you can kind of get the general sense of the vibe of the company. Maybe there needs to be something to switch or to change. So the switching pattern. And sharing opportunities can help the switch. I said earlier, sometimes we catalyze our own changes. That's hard. Coaching helps with that. Some of us put ourselves out there more than, than others, but sometimes we wait and we wait and we wait and we think, gosh, I really need to do something different. Maybe even a career change. You know, it's not necessarily easy. Visualizing opportunities that you have within the company can help people volunteer in for changes. At this company, they had some current hiring plans on, I blocked them out, but they had some hiring plans on whiteboards to encourage people, hey, do you, need, you want to try something new? You know, we'd love for you to like, talk to this manager about this new position. So it doesn't have to only be looking for external people. It could be giving people something else to try. And then they, they have a distributed version of this too. So encouraging people to volunteer in or to have discussions about doing something different. Wonderful guild that I, ha that I have uh, where I'm at now where engineers help other engineers visit and work on a team for two weeks and then go back to their team. So no, we call it nomading. So you go from team to team for a short amount of time and you come back. So it's good for kind of this, they, all, they call it cross-squad pollination as well. But these engineers broker these opportunities for each other. It's kind of a cool switching program. I, do, I generally advise people, it's kind of like, think of your future self. Are you the only one that knows how to change that system? Are you the only one that can support that system? Make yourself a little bit redundant so you're not chained to it. So you don't have to take your laptop on vacation when there's some kind of issue with that area of the code. It's, it's beneficial to, to pair and to work with others so you're not the only one that knows that system. Tushar did that. Tushar on the left, back in the days where people built their own data centers, maybe some people do that. He wanted to work on the team that built the data centers and kind of expand his knowledge. The fact that he paired a lot, switched pairs, made himself, we had collective code ownership, we did a lot of sharing, it's the second startup I was at. He was able to go try something new because he wasn't chained to that system. You know, other people kind of build regular switching into into their work. I interviewed uh, Evan Wiley, who's a program manager at Pivotal Labs Cloud Foundry, which is a pro the, one of their products, Cloud Foundry. They would switch at a regular cadence, and they have an internal tool where they could monitor and understand who's been on what team for how long. Oh, this person might need a change. So they would do deliberate switching to spread knowledge. Isn't that cool? So you know, it helps with the inner team uh, bonding as well. 
Menlo Innovations, great company that builds custom software for different customers in Ann Arbor, Michigan, as, the, as a reaction to how he worked in, as a leader in R&D at a previous company, Richard Sheridan, who's one of the co-founders and also known as their chief storyteller, they pair and switch pairs 100% at Menlo, Menlo Innovations. And you know you're getting into that when you join the company, because they have really good parity between their hiring practices and how they actually work. That's another kind of system to put into continuous improvement as well. People know what they're getting into when they join. Same with at Pivotal. Hunter Industries, where mob programming originated with Woody Zool in Southern California. This was a really cool switching. So they work, they, they do mob programming, which is programming in groups. But here the people <coughs> decide, I want to switch to this mob. They work it out, and then they tell the manager. So it's more of a bottoms up switching. That was also the practices there were derived out of retrospectives. They've really kind of awesome continuous improvement loops. So I went through some patterns with you, the one by one pattern of dynamic reteaming. We talked about grow and split. We talked about switching. I also briefly referenced these other two patterns that I've written about in greater detail elsewhere. But what about you? I asked you some questions about yourself earlier. You talked to people. You know, people are gonna come and go from your companies and it feels different. If any of you are a fan of a hair band like I was with Van Halen, it sounded different when Sammy Hagar joined, right? We're gonna have a lot of changes like this. And so what are we gonna do? Are we gonna grow with it? Are you gonna grow with it as your company morphs? Or are you gonna leave? You get to decide, and I think that's really cool. But I think also to expect is knowing yourself and leading yourself, you're gonna get curveballs. Things are gonna be thrown your way and you get to decide how you respond. And sometimes like, I don't know, like me, you might get triggered. Noticing that and, and, and understanding yourself is helpful in how you respond. But sometimes, you know, again, we, our lizard brain, our amygdala might go off when we have a change that we don't understand. It's normal, it's gonna happen, so you might get triggered. You could also get ejected, <laughs> hopefully not. But think about your last week. Last week for you at your work, when were you energized? When did you feel like, ah, I don't like it. This isn't so great. I don't wanna do that thing again, whatever it was. And when did you feel like you were in flow? There's a great book called Designing Your Life and they talk about keeping a journal with questions like this. They call it a good time journal. And I thought that it's just a, a great way to kind of track how you're feeling. They even have, you can track it on a chart if you're into that kind of stuff. You know, this, we want to try to find the sweet spot about who we are now, what we want to do, and what the company needs. It's kind of always the quest for that, in my opinion. And I'd also encourage you to think bigger than your company. You're here right now working, doing whatever it is that you do, but what's next for you after that? because you're more than, than just that role that you are today or, or that company that you're at or that job that you have. You, there's a lot that you could do. So maybe you're gonna catalyze your change. Maybe you're not gonna wait for that tow truck and you're just gonna push the broken, broken down VW bus. Maybe you're gonna catalyze it. <clears throat> you know, or maybe you love where you are. People misinterpret the, my, some of the, the work that I do with Dynamic Free Team. I'm not saying bust up the teams. If you've got a great thing going, like enjoy it, be there, learn, deepen it, right? Stay where you are, totally valid. So you get to write your own story. You know, it's all about you. Um, so that's, that's all that I have, and thank you so much. I'm Heidi Helfand. You can connect with me on LinkedIn if you wanna keep in touch. I'll be at the conference today. I look forward to meeting more people and um, I'd love to have any, hear any feedback about this talk as well. So thank you so much.